What's good, y'all? It's your boy Ross back at again with another video. So, I'm gonna check out why WrestleMania 17 was almost the darkest day in wrestling history. Now, this is one of my all time favorite WrestleManias, man. One, it uh, happened in the Astrodome in Houston, Texas at the time. Two, one of my two of my favorite wrestlers were part of the main event in uh, um, Stone Cold versus The Rock. It was just, just some like one of the best main events you could possibly ever have at that time. Two of my favorite wrestlers, and then the whole ending was just crazy. Of course, the iconic TLC match that happened at this WrestleMania. Like, there's so many good uh memories about this particular one as a kid growing up this is why it's one of my favorites of all time but in recent years finding out that this wrestlemania almost ended in disaster for those who don't know apparently tommy dreamer uh was really disgruntled and upset with paul paul Heyman at the time he i believe he felt like he was owed some money and all types of stuff and he was essentially planning to go to wrestlemania to murder <laughs> paul Heyman, and then he was gonna you know potentially off himself that's what was uh the rumor is what was reported like that's what he planned on doing so we're gonna check this out it's most likely probably gonna talk about that for those who didn't know but appreciate all love support man wrestlemania would have been remembered for the wrong reasons if it actually did play out that way WrestleMania 17 is regarded by many as the greatest WrestleMania of all time. Sure. While fans in attendance rejoiced in the absolute spectacle that was WrestleMania 17, they had no idea that they very nearly witnessed perhaps the most shocking tragedy in wrestling history. Yeah. Outside the arena waited a desperate individual looking to send a message with a loaded gun. As Paul Heyman called the action at ringside, he had no idea that his life was in danger. He didn't even know. To That's best crazy, explain bro. the situation, we need to go all the way back to the very beginnings of Paul Heyman's ECW. Paul Heyman had been working for WCW as Paul E. Dangerously, mm -hmm. but was ultimately fired from the company after butting heads with WCW's booker, Bill Watts. Heyman would soon join Eastern Championship Wrestling, which he would quickly take over as his own and form Extreme Championship Wrestling. His firing from WCW left a chip on Heyman's shoulders. While yes, he presented ECW as anti-WCW and WWF, his real problem was with WCW. This mentality led to ECW becoming the underground rebel of the wrestling industry. Mm -hmm. Many people credit ECW as being the launching pad for the Attitude Era. Without yeah. this company, we may have never seen Stone Cold Steve Austin drinking a beer and flipping off the boss. Yeah. ACW, got to give them respect for kind of being that that underdog company that personified that era of wrestling. They personified it. Like, WWF at the time... You know, they, they were going in a route. This is before the Attitude Era. They were going in a route that fans weren't really a big fan of. They they were trying to get something going, but they were losing fans. And WCW was trying to gain fans as well. And I think ECW, you have to give them credit to really birthing that Attitude Era type of wrestling. Because they were doing shit that you weren't seeing on both companies. Like, these guys were out here literally killing themselves for the entertainment of those that was in attendance and it was something that fans like damn man this is i'm i'm liking this I, it's a little bit more edgy a little bit more uh more hardcore i'm, I'm all for it and it kind of worked so that's a fair uh uh fair thing to say they kind of if you want to be honest they birthed the attitude era of just in general for wrestling as a whole ECW was edgy, yeah. violent, and dangerous. Yeah. This aura around the company brought an extremely loyal and dedicated fan base. 
Heyman was able to create an us versus them mentality that the fans and the entire locker room would abide by, one of whom was Tommy Dreamer. Uh -huh. By the mid 90s, Dreamer had cemented himself as a core pillar of the ECW brand, his character being described as similar to Die Hard's John McClane, an ordinary man pushed to extraordinary measures. Dreamer was making a name for himself as part of this rebel organization, mm -hmm. and the industry began to take notice. In 1995, Dreamer recalls being offered a WCW contract for $75,000 to join the company. Wow. He would be brought in to form the tag team The American Males and would be making more money than he was making in ECW. Damn. However, Dreamer felt as though ECW had a purpose and was gaining momentum, which it was. Dreamer also felt like he'd be leaving for enemy territory and betraying Heyman's trust. Uh, so Dreamer ultimately declined the offer. That's, and once again, 75000 back then with inflation probably equ equates to roughly 100 something thousand now, maybe a little bit more than that. But I mean, that's that's not bad money. For back then, that's really not bad money at all. And he turned it down for his loyalty. So... You kind of, he's painting a picture of why maybe Dreamer said, yeah, I got to off this guy. He's painting the picture for you. Scotty Riggs would form the American Males tag team with Buff Bagwell instead, and Dreamer would go on to become a true ECW legend. He's often referred to as the heart and soul of ECW. And while he wasn't necessarily making huge money at this time, his name value was certainly growing. And by 1997, WCW came calling again. This time, WCW offered even more money than Ooh. before, but were also interested in signing several other ECW stars. Dreamer recalls Raven, The Pitbulls, uh. The Eliminators, RVD, uh. Sabu, Fonzie, and Sandman all receiving calls from WCW. Dreamer assumed, probably correctly, that WCW weren't necessarily interested in him, but rather interested in hurting Heyman and ECW. Yeah. Dreamer would decline this offer as well and stick with Heyman. During this time, Dreamer would take on more and more responsibility on behalf of the company. He would take on a more managerial role and would even begin booking the matches, all while performing in the ring just as much, if not more, than anybody else. During this time, Dreamer was seen as Paul Heyman's right-hand man. Then, leading into the new millennium, Dreamer would receive yet another call from WCW. Damn. This time, things were a little more interesting. Eric Bischoff would reportedly offer Dreamer a contract of $750,000 in guaranteed pay. And even with inflation now, that's that's uh, still a lot of money. Seven fifty back then. Oof, oof. That get that get real tough. That get real tough to. Mm, damn. This was obviously a significant bump in pay, and Tommy began to weigh these options. Yeah. Bischoff wanted to run an ECW invasion angle on their show, but told Tommy that Heyman was not likely to go for it. Bischoff felt they could still do the angle with a guy like Dreamer. Feeling a loyalty to Heyman, Tommy would call Heyman to try to convince him to cooperate with WCW so that each party could benefit. According to Dreamer, Heyman immediately dismissed the idea and stated, Vince would never forgive me. Tommy immediately picked up on this puzzling statement, but didn't think too much into it at the time. Uh... Instead, he would focus on this offer from WCW and what it would mean to him and his family to make that kind of money. Yeah, that's Dreamer money. was faced with a difficult decision to make. He had been a major factor in the success of ECW. In his words, he was all but running the company. He felt that if ECW took off in the way he believed it could, Dreamer would have the most to gain alongside Paul Heyman. 
being such a cornerstone of the company both in and outside the ring, if ECW were to succeed, he would too. On the other hand, WCW's offer came with a lot less risk, and Dreamer could make a ton of money without the stress of running the entire company. After yeah. much consideration, Dreamer ultimately decided he was headed for WCW. I mean, what are we talking about? Out of about? loyalty to Paul Heyman, Tommy would inform him of his decision face to face. According right. to Dreamer, Heyman would completely break down. Through the tears, Heyman would tell Tommy that ECW would not survive without him, and that all of his friends wouldn't have jobs if he left. This struck a nerve with Dreamer. Considering himself to be a company guy and loyal friend, these words would ultimately lead him to decline WCW wow. once and for all. He declined all that money. He's building up this story to be very, very interesting in understanding why Tommy was that close to saying fuck it and taking Paul Heyman out. Now you're starting to see, especially if the rumors are true that, you know, essentially Tommy didn't get paid potentially some money that he was owed and all this other stuff. You're starting to see this guy put his loyalty over everything. That's a lot of money for you and your family. He threw it aside for loyalty, bro. <laughs> Somewhat ironically, it would be the WWF who would deliver the final blows to ECW. CW, yep. Despite apparently being on good terms with one another, the WWF would swoop in and sign Taz and the Dudley Boys to the WWF. Yep. According to Jim Ross, many people from ECW were actually calling to try to negotiate a deal. Mike Awesome would also leave for WCW as the ECW champion in a bizarre turn of events. And finally, ECW would lose their TV deal with TNN as the WWF landed a deal with the network. ECW struggled financially without a network deal and would ultimately close its doors. Interestingly, it seems as though Heyman and Vince McMahon had been talking for quite some time. According to JR, Vince had been funding ECW with an approximate $50,000 a month to keep the company afloat. Wow. Heyman would approach the USA Network to try and secure another TV deal in which Vince McMahon personally wrote a letter encouraging the network to add ECW to their programming. Wow. These efforts would be in vain, however, as ECW would be unable to secure the deal and the company would soon file for bankruptcy. But it's still interesting to note that McMahon and Heyman were frequently working together during- And this is why he said Vince would be upset with me if he did the angle with WCW because they had been working with you. If he would have took the deal, oh no. He would have been good for at least for himself because the company was essentially going going upside down anyway oh ooh, ooh. this time according to jr on the grilling with jr podcast the wwf simply wanted to keep the company going knowing that they would be first in line to buy their assets when the time came though vince mcmahon has stated that this was in part due to the wwf signing talent from ecw feeling it was only fair to give something back since they were using ecw as a developmental territory in this instance it was better for them to work together and establish a good relationship while facing their more threatening rival wcw Heyman reportedly did not disclose the working relationship with Vince nor the company's financial struggles to anybody in the locker room. When Dreamer eventually found out about the financial uncertainty, he decided to put some of his own money into the company. Seeing himself as Heyman's partner, he claims to have put both his and his parents' money into the company so that they could continue the fight against WCW and the WWF not knowing that Vince McMahon and Heyman were already working together. 
Dis- oh, yeah. Now I see. Now I see why he felt like he, he owed him money. It, it makes sense. It definitely makes sense why he felt like he, he owed him money. He put money up not thinking, you know, that the company, well, thinking that the company needed it, could use it when it didn't really, none of that really matter. He could have saved that. He could have went to WCW. So, hell yeah. I definitely would be like, hey, bro, you owe me. I was putting up money and none of it even really mattered. You was already working with Vince. I could have saved that. I could have saved that. I could have, you know, used it for my family. I could have went to WC. Despite these efforts, ECW would declare bankruptcy at the end of the year 2000. And the fight for ECW was over. In the span of about a year, Dreamer had gone from declining three quarters of a million dollars from WCW to now watching both companies close their doors. After the final ECW show on January 13, 2001, the company was forced into bankruptcy proceedings. During this time, Paul Heyman would be brought on as a color commentator in the WWF filling in for Jerry Lawler, who had left the company in protest for the firing of his then-wife, Stacy Carter. Heyman would reportedly promise to bring Dreamer in with him on multiple occasions, oh. but after all of these plans fell through, Dreamer began to get desperate. In the weeks leading up to WrestleMania 17, Heyman would again call Dreamer to tell him he would have a spot on the show in the now legendary TLC match. However, these plans would again fall through for unknown reasons, and Dreamer's spot would be taken by Rhino. Uh. Then later, Heyman would tell Dreamer once again that he would debut in a hardcore match at WrestleMania, with quote, the focus being entirely on you. But these plans too would be cancelled. Uh. Dreamer was now feeling a lot of resentment towards Heyman. Of course, you put your money up. Just to find out that the company was going to close regardless, that it wasn't going it wasn't going well financially. He doesn't tell you that. You think there's a partnership. You think there's some loyalty there. You don't go to WCW after all the money they offered you because you wanted to be loyal. Then you're waiting for this guy to put you in these high profile situations and it keeps falling through. I can get. I can definitely get. Why someone be like, yeah, it's up for you. When you owe somebody money, money and loyalty, those are the few things in this world that will actually break a person. And they it's hard to, you know, kind of come back from. Money and loyalty will break people. And clearly this is what happened. The man who Dreamer had considered a close friend and business partner had lied to him about ECW's financial position, had accepted his and his family's money without telling him that McMahon was already pouring money into it, had begged Dreamer not to take the biggest yeah. contract of his life, and was seemingly now lying to Dreamer once again with the promise of a WWF run that simply wasn't coming to fruition. Feeling betrayed, Tommy would fall into a deep depression. Uh -huh. According to Dreamer himself, his thoughts would get darker by the day and soon convinced himself that Paul Heyman had to pay. Tommy was working on the indies during this time and found himself in Texas just a few days out from WrestleMania 17, which was also set to take place in Texas. While at the indie show, Tommy would see a sign permitting firearms into the building, with a staff member explaining that in Texas, you can carry a weapon on you when entering a venue. This would spark a sinister plan in Tommy's head. According to Dreamer himself, he had decided he was going to get revenge on Heyman in the most brutal and public way possible at the showcase of immortals oh my god while the bro. event was taking place his plan was to simply walk into the houston astrodome with a loaded gun and at some point during the broadcast he would appear behind the announcer's desk live on tv jump the barricade and shoot Heyman in front of a live audience oh. he would then hit his signature pose before turning the gun on himself uh -huh. and ending it all Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Jeez, this man. may seem like some twisted daydream with zero intention behind it. However, according to Dreamer, he was absolutely set on this plan. In his mind, Heyman had ruined his and his family's lives and thought he would be, quote, the ultimate martyr for these actions. He apparently got so far into this plan as to actually show up outside the Astrodome with a loaded gun. While the event was taking place, Dreamer was apparently across the street sitting in his car with a loaded weapon. There's some speculation from a few different sources that he had secured a front row ticket from a scalper and was ready to execute his plan. Damn. Fortunately, earlier that day, Dreamer had received a phone call. It was an unrecognized number, so he hadn't answered the phone, but the caller did leave a voicemail. At some point during the evening, Dreamer decided to check this voicemail. The message was from none other than good old JR. Wow, I think hey, I Tommy, remember. It's Jim Ross. I think I remember hearing that JR uh, did end up calling him, and that's kind of how things changed. Just wanted to let you know we are still thinking about you. We are going to get it done. Just got to hang tight. Thank you. Wow. This single phone call gave Dreamer a glimmer of hope. Until now, Dreamer had only heard from Heyman about any WWF plans. But now JR himself, who was head of talent uh -huh. relations, was telling him that they had plans for him and that they were in fact thinking of him. While it may never be a $750,000 contract, it was still an opportunity. This phone call let Dreamer know that he wasn't forgotten by the world of wrestling and there was still hope for his career. Dreamer would thankfully drive away, and what would have probably been the darkest broadcast in television history never came to be. WrestleMania 17 would go on to become a legendary event, and Dreamer would eventually be brought into the WWF on July 9th, 2001, as part of the Invasion storyline. Uh -huh. Ironically, once again, standing side by side with Paul Heyman. That is crazy. This was a very great video. We're going to go ahead, give this person a like. Let me move my stuff out the way so y'all can see who this person is, man. Uh, Wrestle Lore, definitely go subscribe. To, I'm, I'm a subscribe. They should have way more subscribers than this. They only have 7,000 subscribers. Definitely go subscribe to them, man. This was a well-produced uh, video, how it was set up and everything. And it just it goes to show, bro. How one phone call changed everything. If he didn't get that phone call from good old JR, Paul Heyman may not be here. Hell, WWF or WWE, I don't, we don't know the landscape of what would have happened. It would have been a lot of shit. It, it, things happen for a reason. And I'm so glad that JR unknowingly ended up saving paul Heyman's life man but you understand you get a a you get a a bit of understanding on why dreamer would go to those extremes now going getting the full context of the story when you you betray a man's trust you betray his loyalty and then you you essentially take money from him oh nah and you call yourself a friend, a business partner, those are the quickest ways to get someone to snap. So comment down below. Let me know, man, what other videos y'all want me to check out. I definitely will for y'all. Appreciate all the love support y'all shown on the channel. Road to 150K. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See you on the next one. Peace.